Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. I loved this interview with artist Barbara Johansson Newman. She has had such an interesting career, from puppetry to illustration to licensing. And now she's gone back to her first love, which is painting. What I like about Barbara's art is that although she does really interesting figurative paintings in themselves, she adds another dimension by building a world around them. She uses found objects and paints on unusual surfaces. She's also a big advocate of doodling, which inspired me to do a bit of doodling in my sketchbook again. So I really hope that this interview will inspire you too. So Barbara, thank you so much for talking to us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, The first thing we'd love to know is when did your love of drawing begin? Um, It's it's a little bit hard to believe, but when I was a baby, um, my mother gave me crayons and I actually used to draw on the wall in my crib. And so, uh, and, and, you know, she was fine with it. It was an older house. She didn't care. And, uh, that is when it began. My, both of my parents were artists. And so I think it was just kind of, um, I was pre-programmed to be that way. So did you take any photos of the wall of the masterpieces you created? No, but I did happen to go into that house uh, some years later after we'd long moved away and the drawings were still there. Oh, I wow. can still see not, not drawing scribbles, you know, truly just scribbles, but, and I, I was always drawing. It's just was something that I was always doing. Um, and I do remember being frustrated as a little girl because, you know, you, you have in, you know, my mother could draw beautifully and you have in your mind what you want it to look like, but it, you can't do it yet because you're still a kid. Um, but it was always just part of my life. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't ever remember not drawing. So. So did you take the traditional route and go to art college? I did. I started out at a school uh, not far from New York for my first year. Um, I had to apply. I had to go there with my portfolio and, you know, they looked through it, whether or not they were going to accept me. I got in and it was not a good match. And um, I had, I wanted to really, I just really just wanted to draw and paint. And in the early seventies, everything was conceptual art. And, uh, and that, and that was what they were into. So there, you know, I think we went, I went a whole semester and there were no drawing projects whatsoever. And then finally I just decided this is not going to work. And, uh, I ended up transferring to a local community college near my home. And it was wonderful because I took, I think that first semester I took five art courses and that's all I did was draw and paint and sculpt. And I was in heaven and I had very high quality teachers because they were all professional artists and some of them are actually driving up from New York City. So, you know, the the, the level of the education was great at, uh, you know, a a tenth of the price. So were they teaching you technique as well of how to how to paint? You know, they they didn't. We I can remember the art department at that time was in like an old building, an old farm building old farmhouse and up on the third floor was both the painting studio, the drawing studio and the sculpting studio in the same room. And they would just bring a model in and we'd be be there with our sketchbooks or our canvases and we would just work. And every now and then, like I had a drawing teacher that would give us a little bit of advice. And um, for example, he, he said, you know, the leaf touched twice by the hand dies. In other words, don't overwork. Don't overwork your drawings. And I, that always stuck in my head for years. And my, the, the, the art director, the head of the program, the head of the art department, when I first came in with a painting, you know, to kind of get a feel, he looked at my work and he just said, just, you know, Barbara, just draw it out of your head. So there was no real technique for, for painting and drawing. Where I learned technique was in the printmaking class because I didn't have a clue about that. And, uh, and so then I had to learn, you know, about it and I loved it. I loved etching in particular and, um, would block print. 
So that was where I learned technique. And then when I transferred to another state school in Buffalo, um, I learned, I took a course, Methods and Materials, and I actually learned the technique of working with uh, egg tempera, like like old fashioned egg tempera. Mm. Um, and, and I liked that, but there was so little technique taught. They just, you know, you were kind of left to your own devices. Don't you think it's strange that when people sort of think, oh, I want to go to art school, which is what I wanted to do. I assume, like most people, that when you do a course at art college, you're going to learn the techniques of drawing and painting. But actually, you don't, do you? You're right. It is. No. It, you know, you were saying about the 70s, it being mostly conceptual. I don't think that's changed. I think, um, you know, it's quite disappointing when you get there and you have to find other avenues. Well, I think I think this is where, and, and I don't know this, I've just learned this recently, this is where the so-called academies come in, where yeah. you actually go. And it's just the opposite, of course. Then they drill you down on the technique. Mm. Um, you know, you can spend a whole semester in an, in a, an art theory uh, class and mix learning to mix colors. And it's, you know, yeah. <laughs> that, to be honest, that would have driven me crazy too, yeah. um, you know. But it'd so, be good to have a know, bit of a balance, wouldn't it? <laughs> I think I think I think so. I mean, I I did the the little bit of technique that I learned um, was helpful, but essentially, you know, I I I've said this to people because when later on I became an illustrator and they asked me, "Well, did you go to school to be an illustrator?" and I said, "No," you know, and could you can you be an illustrator without going to art school? And I said, "Absolutely," because everything I'm doing, I had to teach myself. Um, and so I think you can be self-taught as an artist. I think you just have to have the will and it's, you know, there's, I've worked with watercolor. I've never really understood the traditional technique of working with watercolor. You know, you just kind of fly by the seat of your pants and, um, you know, you have to be adventurous, I would think. And I would, and I would encourage anyone who wants to be an artist and hasn't gone to art school. You absolutely don't need to go to art school. <laughs> You know, just just do it. Just really do it. It's learned by experience. So true. So true. But you you started your career, didn't you, in a puppet theatre, uh, which I was really intrigued about. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what made you eventually change direction and then go into uh, illustration? Well, the in that community college that I was attending, I was working part time at a school and teaching art. And I met another woman there who was a puppeteer and got to know her very well. And uh, she just recently retired, but she was quite successful. And she and I and another and one of her other puppeteers that she worked with we drove into the city for a summer studying with Bill Baird, who at the time had um, this theater in the village, in the Greenwich Village. And we, we learned to make puppets and we learned to operate marionettes. And we, we went up in his stage and I just fell in love just absolutely fell in love with puppetry. And so it was, it was quite by accident. And um, I was getting ready to transfer up to Buffalo with my um, then uh, fiance, now husband, and he embraced it. And, um, and so we started, he built us a stage and we went up to Buffalo and uh, we're in our junior year in college. And as it turns out, I was really good at making puppets, but I really wasn't very good at acting. <laughs> so, and, he, and he was excellent. He was just excellent. But we did that for a few years, about four years. We did puppet shows for hospitals or churches or private part birthday parties. And he really carried, carried it. And, and what happened was we got hired to do a craft, perform at a craft fair. And they didn't want to pay us our $25 fee. And so I said, okay, well, give us a table. I'm going to make in puppets for sale. And then that's how it began. Um, I got invited to exhibit at another craft fair, which we were performed at. And then, and then I realized I really don't want to perform. <laughs> I really just want to make puppets. And then they, they morphed into soft sculpture dolls. And so I just, my, just one thing just led to another, which really has been like my entire life as an artist, I just, the wind blows me in a direction and I, I happen to follow it and that's where I end up next. And so I quite by accident ended up in the world of fine crafts in the seventies 
which was a renaissance really um, for fine crafts and craft shows and um, doing doing those fairs, those American Craft Council fairs. And, and it was just purely by accident, by serendipity that I ended up doing that. And I loved it. And so, and then when we moved to Boston, um, I was teaching a soft sculpture course at, uh, and I got to take a free course. And I, so I took a course in graphic design because I had no clue about getting things to print and, um, things, words like camera ready and half tones. I knew none of that. And then I realized I really just want to illustrate. And that was by accident because I happened to take that course. And so I put together a portfolio and, um, eventually about six months later, I started taking it around and then I got my first work. So I take my portfolio around. So if we, if we took a trip to Florida, I take my portfolio and go visit the newspapers and the magazines. If we went out West, I took my portfolio and I'd stop in along the way and make, so it was, you know, it was, it was an adventure, but it was fun. Yeah. So. Amazing. So how do you go about creating new characters for your illustrations? Uh, well, for the book illustrations, it was, you know, um, for the ones I've written, they were clearly in my head. And then you just, you know, you sit down and you, you do character studies and you just sketch out the image in your head of what comes to mind for the characters. For things I've, I've illustrated for, for other authors, um, I'll sketch, I would sketch a few characters. For example, I did a series, I illustrated a series by David Adler and, they sent me the manuscript and I came up with my come some character ideas for my the protagonist, the main protagonist, the little boy. And they picked the one that they kind of like best. And then what happens is it it evolves. You don't actually it, you know, it's he started out one way and then he kind of evolved into my own development of uh, of a character but that's you know that's sometimes you're working in conjunction with the editor you're never working with the author because one of the things with children's book publishing is the uh the publishers are very good at keeping the authors and the illustrators from connecting with each other because they want they want the illustrator to bring his or her own vision to the story of the manuscript. And they don't want the author to micromanage, oh, I want this to be blue, I want this to be yellow. So I never got to meet any of my authors that I illustrated for. Um, and so that was, I would say that oh, that's really a good thing uh, because then it, it kind of frees you up to have your own vision and work with what's in your own head. And it's interesting, like you say, they send you the manuscript. So you read the book, is that right? So you read the book, then you Correct. you sort of build up a picture in your head of what you see the character as, and then you go ahead and draw it. Right. And it's like a, it's like a movie. You see, when you're reading the manuscript, you're mm. seeing a movie in your head. And so you're going to pick the scenes, you know, you're yeah. the director, you want to pick the scenes that you want to put on the spread of the pages. Now a normal children's picture book is about 32 pages. And so that's so many spreads because you have to account for the title page, the dedication page, the ISBN page, whatever. And then you have to, you have to kind of get that movie into say 15 spreads, 14s, depending um, on the page count. And that's what you do. You become the director of your own little movie and you're following the script of the manuscript but you're seeing it in your head as it's playing along and then you have to kind of pick out what's key. And then, you know, they'll, you, that's just, a lot of that is determined by the pagination, what, what words are going to go on what pages. And sometimes the illustrator will determine that. And sometimes that's already determined. Like for the chapter book series I illustrated, they sent me the actual printout of the pages showing me where the art was going to go. And so it enabled me, I would look at what the scene was and then to come up with the scene for those particular spaces, I knew the shape and the size of the space. So, so, so when you're working these things out, do you just start with pencil sketches and show them that and then develop from there? Yes, mostly I'm a pencil sketcher. Um, one of the things I did get eventually doing for my last books was I illustrate on my computer. So I have a tool that's called a Cintiq. Um, it's by Wacom or Wacom, and it enables me to actually draw right on my screen. Uh, and I would, and I started, I learned to sketch on the computer using the tool, the pencil tool. 
And uh, that, that helped. I still, my favorite tool still is a pencil, but it, I was able to come close using Photoshop and then the, the sketching tool on the Cintiq, like sketching the art into, into the places. And my last, my last five, eight books were all I illustrated in Photoshop or, and or Painter. Yeah, because um, I've been doing some illustrating recently for a book that Tara and I wrote. And um, what I love, I we I use Procreate at the moment. And uh, what I love about using that is there's an undo button. <laughs> and of course, oh, when, right. when you're doing it in pen and ink, you know, if you do make mistakes, you, you can't just undo it. You've got to do it again. <laughs> so that's what I no. love about the uh, Procreate. You can just go undo. And then how many times, how many times have I tried to, on a pencil sketch, have I actually tried to laugh? So my sketch to move it. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And that, it's so good, isn't it? Because you can think, oh, I wish I tilted her head back a little bit or blah, blah, blah. That's right. And you can just, right. you can just do it. It's brilliant. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's this, and this neck is a little long or that eye yeah. is not in the right place. And it's I thought, oh, this is but, but now, of course, I've gone the other, the other direction. I still use my computer and my Cintiq for my studies. So, you know, years ago, like an artist would just do a series of sketches and studies for a particular painting. Well, I go back and forth on the computer now. So I'll take a picture. I'll start out with a pencil sketch. I'll scan it in, scan it into, um, usually what I do is just use my iPhone and, and send myself an email and I'll bring it up in Photoshop and I'll get it positioned just right for the canvas or the board that I'm working painting on. And, uh, and then I'll print it out and I'll take it over to my canvas and I'll, I'll by hand transfer it onto the canvas or the wood or the panel. And then at different stages along the way, I'll take picture again. I'll bring it back into Photoshop. I'll see what it looks like if I do this. What if I look like do that? I'll print it out. I go, it's a terrible waste of paper, but, um, that's what I do. That's, and that's how I, I work out all my problems in my paintings. I think that's uh, clever. That's a really clever way of doing it. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a time saver, and it enables me to like if I want to introduce an element into a painting without actually having to paint it and then paint over it, I'll do it on the computer first. Um, it's good, so it's it's great. I I love it. Good way of testing it out first, isn't it? Um, you also wrote three of your own children's books, and um, I was yes. wondering what inspired you to do that and how you've found the process and I presume you illustrated those yourself I did I did I um I started writing in the 80s and uh I you know I was I was new to children's publishing and so um I think I wrote my first manuscript which came back of course <laughs> and then you have to get if you want to be if you want to work in the field of children's books you will get the thickest skin in the world because it's just rife with rejection. So that came back, but, and rightfully so, my very first story. And then I wrote, um, an, another manuscript that was a series of, uh, 10, uh, 10 poems, 10 short poems about working cats. And one, I, I went into New York and in, into the city with my portfolio to visit the publishers and the art I think it was the art director came down and she pointed to one of the stories and she said, turn this in to its own book. And, uh, I, it took me a while, you know, I got sidetracked with doing a lot of editorial illustration. Then I got sidetracked with raising a family. And then eventually I took that, that particular thing that she had pointed to that particular little poem and I developed it into a picture book picture book length and manuscript, some character sketches for it. And uh, the, the, the editor that I was working with and the publisher I was working with in New York at the time loved the manuscript, but they were going to hire another illustrator for it because I was not known as an illustrator. I was not well known. So she wanted to do the, the editor in chief of the publisher wanted to do what was called star dusting. So she was going to take my manuscript and make, give me a famous illustrator to illustrate it. And I said, no, <laughs> so I said, no, 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 not going to happen. And I took it back and I continued to send it out and submit it. And then, um, fortunately, eventually the editor whom I worked with and loved on a, on a series at that publisher went to another publisher and she bought it 
and I illustrated it. And so that cooked, um, that cooked in the oven for 22 years. From wow. The initial, the initial concept to when I finally either, it was either when I sold the manuscript or when I held the book in my hand. So it was a long time in, in, uh, you know, whatever cooking. <laughs> so, wow. so I say people be patient. <laughs> wow. So you later moved on to design licensing and then finally painting Well, that you describe painting as your first love. So what made you venture away from illustration and what is it about painting that you really love so much? Well, with illustration, um, and I think my work always had an illustrative leaning to it. Um, you know, you're, you know, you're either, you're working just to a manuscript, you know, if it's your own, that's wonderful. Or with editorial illustration, which I actually loved, you get sent the article for a magazine or a newspaper article, and then you have to bring your vision to it. And I liked that. Um, and then when I left, when I had children, my work softened. I had a very edgy, almost a dark side to my editorial illustration. And then when I started having children and raising a family, my work softened and I started getting calls from educational publishers. And that was good, but that came with a lot more restriction. I had much freer reign as an editorial illustrator. They were one off. I could be I could create one piece of artwork. I didn't have to create a, bring a character through an entire book. I didn't have to work with restrictions in publishing. Um, I still loved it. I still loved being doing the children's books because there was something about holding a book in your hands after you've illustrated a book. The thing with editorial illustration is you could do a wonderful piece of artwork and find it very satisfying, but that end product still ends up in the trash on Monday morning. And then here was this book. I had this entire book, hard covered book that had all my illustrations in it. And it was a very satisfying feeling to not be illustrating for something that was to be discarded so readily. Um, but um, over the course of years, you know, publishing is a is a tough business and a frustrating business. And you you have to work with um, a lot of direction and you have to be willing to take a lot of direction. and. Uh, you know, and, and or after you do the book, are you going to worry, does it get good reviews? And then if it gets good reviews, ultimately, is it going to sell? And then, you know, it, it was, it's so out of your control. And it wasn't, it wasn't really floating my boat anymore. It wasn't giving me the kind of artistic fulfillment that I needed. Um, and licensing was dipping my toes into something different in that. I created the images that I wanted to create, which was like almost going back originally to when I made the dolls. I made what I wanted to make and then I found the market for it. So I did a show in, uh, in New York called Surtex. You may have heard of it. Yeah. And uh, that's a license, like a surface and design uh, show, trade show. And I dipped my toe into those waters for three years and I, I got a fabric license and um, I worked with, a, you know, a fabric producers for a while. And I did that. But ultimately, <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't as satisfying either. And then I had more books come out. And then I, you know, it was just this series of events like it was the universe was sending me messages is that, you know, you really need to move on and go back to just painting. And I had this studio outside my house that I wasn't really using. And um, my husband says, I paint, you just, why don't you just paint? And I happened to get a call from a woman, an art consultant who picked up some of my postcards that had my paintings on them in my, in my building, my studio building. And she goes, well, I'm putting together a show and blah, blah, blah. And so that was the beginning of it. Um, that was almost like the final sign from the universe that it was time for me to leave publishing and just just paint again. So presumably you hadn't painted for a while by that, that point. So did it feel alien to you? Well, you know, I had my first book as author. I, I painted in acrylics, acrylic gouache. Yeah. And um, so I had done, so I had illustrated a number of books with real paint. Um, you know, it it was still illustration. They were still children's book illustrations, but it, but they, you know, they weren't what I work, what I do now. Mm. 
but I had worked with paint, but I hadn't worked with paint freely, you know, just doing what I wanted to do. That wasn't, you know, it's kind of like riding a bike. Yeah. You know, you just never, you never not know how to do it. it you may be a little rusty. It's like drawing as well. You know, you just, you know, you get a little, you're a little rusty, but you get, the, it comes back to you pretty quickly. And I noticed that your work is uh, mainly figurative. So what draws you to painting people in particular? I th- I, you know, it's, it's all I've ever really wanted to do. When I was making the dolls, the, the soft mm. sculpture figure, I, that's all I wanted to do. Um, you know, I, that was the fun about illustrating books, of course. And uh, almost all of, I think all of my editorial illustration were people, were portraits or people or, you know, characterizations or whatever. Um, I just, I just like the figure. I like characters. I like faces. I like, there's just something special. There's an, you know, there's a hint of a story and then, you know, you, you're just trying to convey it without actually saying it. Um, you know, I lose myself in those details that, that tell a person to tell you who a person is or a character is. Um, I don't know, just, I've always been drawn to the figure always. I can't remember not wanting to do pictures or paintings of people. So if you're going to do a painting, are, are, are you using reference for one? And how, how do you start? Have you got this big idea in your head or do you just start drawing and see what happens? Well, it's, I generally just sketch first. So I have a sketchbook and I'll put on um, some kind of a program or a podcast or music or a book, an audio book, and I'll just sketch and see what develops. So if I'm not doing a painting of a specific person, um, then I'm going to just work out of my head and I'll get it down. I'll get the layout down. I'll get the characters down. You know, um, if I need like a reference, for example, um, you know, if I, if I want to put a, like a, one of the paintings I did was in t- started out with a sketch from my sketchbook. It's uh, a man and a woman surrounded with their pets. I, 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 you know, I need, I wanted to put uh, a dog in the front. And I wanted it to be like a pit bully kind of dog. And I didn't really know what they look like. So then I'll go online and I'll study some pictures about, well, what do they really look like? And how did their, what is their fur like? And the same thing with a parrot. I put a parrot on her shoulder. And I said, you know, let me look at some pictures of parrots. So I use it for reference to understand the, the anatomy or the actual, the way they, they are, um, and, and, uh, and so for that kind of thing, like, you know, for me, when I did my text and sugar book, which was a cowboy cat book, I didn't have a clue really how to draw a horse or a cow. And so I had to really study what, you know, what they look, what the, what they look like, what the cattle look like, what the pigs look like, what the horses look like. You know, that was not my, my thing of choice to sketch ever horses ever. <laughs> and so I had to get familiar. And so with certain things, if I don't, if, if I can't draw upon it in my head, like I know I can, you know, draw people very easily, but I don't always know what a particular animal might look like. And so that's when I'll, I'll look for some photo reference so I can understand it better. And then I'll bring my own um, interpretation to it. Do you have a character in mind then when you start? Are you thinking I'm going to paint this couple with animals or is it just when you start scribbling that sort of appears? Well, I started, I was, it was an open studios event and I sketched the, this couple just out of my head. And then they, I said, you know, I kind of like that. I think I'm going to turn that into a painting. And then I, you know, they morphed. I think I took a picture of the sketch and, and brought it up in Photoshop and played around. I said, you know what, the composition needs something. And so that's when I, I think I came up with the, the two cats and the dog and the chair and the, the parrot. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's about, you know, you have this, this space, you have this panel, this canvas or whatever, and you have to figure out how to fill it in a satisfying way. And so for me, composition is really very important. So I may, you know, I, I'll add something, not because I necessarily feel this philosophical need that they should have a parrot on the shoulder, but the composition tells me she needs a parrot on her shoulder. You know, sometimes it's just as, as simple as that. It's, you know, ultimately it's, it's creating a painting that's satisfying to look at that. I like the textures and the composition and the colors and, you know, and, and that, you know, it's a little different when you're doing a specific person. Like I've done three paintings now of Frida Kahlo. 
And, you know, first I had to learn what Frida Kahlo really looked like. And I had to learn what her husband Diego looked like. And, you know, you have to, I, I don't copy exact photographs when I do portraits of specific people. Um, I create my own, but I need to know what they look like. And so you, you have to look at the kind of clothing that she wears or the kind of animals that she had. And um, one of my pieces was I did her tattooed. And so I did tattoos and she had tattoos of all her reputed lovers on her body. <laughs> and so you have to, it's a, it's a combination between you know, replication of something specific, you know, as in portraits of specific people and, but also bringing your own vision to it. Um, and you know, that's, it's a combination. It's a balancing act between photo reference, but imagination. You circling back quickly to what you said earlier, you, you mentioned that you, uh, draw and paint while you listen to podcasts or, um, audio books. Um, is there a reason for that? Do, do you find that that helps you get into the zone? It does because I find that I do my best work when I'm not thinking too much about it. Mm. So in other words, there it's, there's something instinctive about when I sketch that I, my mind needs to be on something else so that my heart is actually doing the artwork. Um, and I find I make, make my best marks doing that. And the analogy is, as I don't know if you talk on the phone and you're doodling, you know, sometimes the, the best sketches I've ever done have been my doodles when I'm talking on the phone. And I've actually, sometimes I'll look at the page that I happen to fill when I'm talking and it can be talking to anybody. It can be talking to insurance agent or something. And I'll look at what the marks that I've made on a piece of paper, because I have to make marks when I talk on the phone. And I'll say, you know, I could, I'll take some of this pattern. Maybe I'll put some of these patterns into my next painting. Um, and it's getting to that place. There's a special place inside of us that, um, that knows what to do for the artwork. And you need to get to that, get to that zone. I get into that zone when I listening to something else and something, it's like, you know, it's something takes over. It's like a uh, muscle memory. You just, you just, you just set loose. You just create something. It's like sometimes, you know, when you're driving, when you drive place and you say, how did I get here? Because your mind has been on something else. I was just and about that's kind to of, use that very analogy there, that that's w- yeah. what happens often to me. <laughs> Yeah, and you have and you have no memory. And how do I don't remember? Like I draw, and I'm here, and I've got to this place, and I've been here before because I was busy. You're busy thinking about something else, and so for me, that's what drawing and painting is. I need to get to that zone. I to- I totally relate because I'm exactly the same in the studio. If if it's silent, I find it almost off putting. Whereas no, and then you start it, right. You start reliving every argument you ever had with anybody, <laughs> <laughs> and that's worse. <laughs> and so it's you know it's, I have to put my mind my mind away yeah. someplace. You know, I was wondering, are you actually doodling now while we're talking? Uh, I actually am not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I have to confess, I'm not that relaxed <laughs> that, I, that I could do that. Although I, it did occur to me to just grab a pencil and paper because my finger's a little itchy. So. <laughs> so what I love about your work is that you don't just use canvases, do you? You use all these found materials and different surfaces. So can you just talk us through sort of how you started that and why you do it? Well, I, I, um, I think when I first returned to painting, I had these old uh, dough boards, antique dough boards that I had collected. And I love, I love painting on a hard surface. And I started painting on wood, on real wood. And um, then it, you know, it's what am I going to do with this? And I had all kinds of notions about how am I going to you know, present this. Am I just going to hang the wood on the wall? And I have a dear friend who's an artist. And I said, you know, Rich, help me. Can, I had a panel, a painting that was done in three, in two panels. And I said, Rich, can you help me figure out how can I put these together so that, um, you know, they look like one piece. And do I put, I was, I was thinking very, very simply, I'm going to put two hinges or something and just attach them. And he took it and he came back with that piece. There's one piece on my uh, website where he put these sled runners on the side and all these peripheral found architectural elements. And I said, oh my God, that's it. 
that's that's the combination because I used to do that a little bit with the dolls I little mixed materials you know it wasn't just dolls it was threads it was dyes I would paint my own fabrics and so that was the kind of mixed materials approach that just it just all of a sudden it was like a light bulb went off and um and so I started doing it that way and I worked with Rich a little bit and then started totally creating my own creations in the way that you know I had been inspired by him so so these found pieces do you ever now just use a straight canvas or do you always feel like you need that piece as well you know it's it's I I'm kind of addicted I'm trying to get a little bit simplified <laughs> on the piece now um first of all because it's it's really difficult to ship them um and you know and i've been starting to send them out to shows um but also because i i want to just spend more time just worrying about the painting itself so i've been buying instead of the solid wood the antique dough boards i've been buying wooden panels that you can buy from an art supply house. And um, my husband, you know, we work together and I tell him what I'm thinking of for a frame and then he creates it for me. But I always want to have to add something else to it. Like, um, you know, something on the top, which might be part of a, an industrial mold or on one on my Frida piece. I think, I, you know, those, you know, those iron claw feet with the balls. Yeah. That would be on the bottom of piano stool. So I put a couple of those on. Um, it, I just, I have a piece that I'm working on now. It's a party group and uh, they're going to be holding noisemakers and thing. And I'm actually, I have a bunch of, cause I have a lot of collections in my house, which is, which is crazy. I have every collection known to man, but one of my collections is tin toys and noisemakers. And I want to somehow take some actual noisemakers and um, it's, this will be a, a tarp painting. And um, it'll have a piece of wood on the top that it'll hang from and suspend from and be anchored with wood on the bottom. And then um, I'm going to, I'm looking, I'm trying to find the perfect uh, noisemakers to attach to the wood. So it's like, I can't stop myself for some reason. I just have to, I have to junk it up a little. <laughs> I keep thinking, should I just do something on canvas for a change? But I, I just, I don't know. I just had bring myself to do that i have to either do something to the frame augment the frame or embellish the frame in some place and now i'm thinking maybe there would be ways that i'd embellish and i have embellished the surface itself the painting oh it's really unique but, i think it i mean and your style itself is, is really distinct ha has that style changed over time it has um you know it, it, when I was an, an editorial illustrator, it was kind of edgy and dark and more realistic. And then I morphed into doing work for kids and children's publishing and it got soft just by the nature of, I don't know, raising children and doing for children. And then I started painting and my first paintings before I actually totally put the children's books aside were, um, more whimsical, a little funkier. Um, a little more lighthearted. I, I still have all of those. I was thinking, should I go back and rework them? Should I, I took them off my website and now it's gone back to the edgy, the dark, and it's getting, it seems to be getting edgier and darker <laughs> <laughs> and it's less, I'm losing some of that whimsy that was in my illustration, my earlier illustration work. So, um, You're evolving. you know, I don't know. I, it does. And, you know, I think you just kind of have to, and I would say that for artists, that has to be, you have to be willing to go where the wind blows you. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that my whole career has been a combination of pluck and serendipity. And I, some, it's like, it's almost like it's out of my control where I go next. It's something will just lead me. The universe will send me a sign. I know that sounds kind of flaky, but <laughs> the universe will send me a sign and I'll end up going in that direction. And then the next thing I know, I'm in a whole different place. Because I was going to ask you, actually, um, so many artists, that seems to be the most important thing on their mind, isn't it? Trying to find a style. But I wonder if that's just something that happens more by accident, the less you're trying in a way. How do you, what do you think I about think that? 
I, th- I think it is. And I think like you, the, the key for me anyway, and, and I think I said this even for if you're an abstract artist, is that you have to continue to make marks and draw. Mm. And it's like, you know, everybody has an individual handwriting and everybody has an individual way of making marks down on a canvas or a paper. And the only way you're going to discover that is to keep doing it. And, you know, and it's, it's, and I think styles do evolve. And, you know, if you put it down for a while and you return to it, you're still the same artist. Like people tell me they can tell my work over the years is always my work. But to me, it looks strikingly different um, because it's, it's something has changed. You know, when I, when I went back to doing more serious painting, something had changed. Um, and yeah, cause I had gotten stuck with books again and then I went back to painting again then my work was different than it was say five years earlier so it's it's you know it's evolved it does evolve styles do evolve I think you the inherent um crux of who you are is always present in your work but it it does it changes it shifts slightly so so as well as the fun bit of like actually doing the paintings, there's obviously a promotion involved to try and sell it. So have you got any tips for doing that? Well, I don't right now have gallery representation because I've only, I only finally said goodbye to publishing around 2016, 2017 to focus on painting. And um, I don't have gallery representation, but what I do is I actually, I want to get the work seen. And first of all, Instagram is like magic. You know, you have, you know, all of a sudden you have an ability to share your work with thousands of people. Um, But aside from that, I look for call for entry um, opportunities. So I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but in the States, there are, in fact, many of the, the things I check out in the States are international. So I look for opera, I look for shows that interest me. Um, that's how I ended up painting Frida. There was a show in uh, California at a gallery, the Bedford Gallery, and there was, it was the world of Frida. And I thought, you know, I like Frida. She's an interesting, um, image. I'll do some Frida paintings. And, uh, and so I actually, there was enough time that I actually created paintings specifically to submit to that show. Or if, or I might have paintings that, sub, you know, that match what they're calling for a bird show or <clears throat> found out there was an awesome blage found object show and that I have work in now in Maryland. And so that's for me, that's how I, I've been getting my work out there. I've been, well, I'm continuing to build a body of work. Um, I get some exhibitions to put down on my CV. Uh, you know, that's, it seems to be working. It's, it's satisfying me. I don't have a gallery yet. Um, I don't know that I'll, you know, I don't know that I'll have a specific gallery. It's, you know, it's that model may be changing as you probably know, you know, how, how artists get their work sold. I was going to say, I'm not sure these days it's, it's as important anymore. I mean, that used to be the be all and end all, didn't it? For artists getting a work shown in the gallery. But the thing is where the internet has come in, it's changed everything. And a lot of artists aren't, aren't doing that anymore. They're just promoting themselves. It is. And some people are very, very good at it. Yeah. Um, I'm learning. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I, it's, it's, I recently sold a piece that they had checked out my website. It's sold it to a local collector. And then I met them over in my, my studio where I now I use, I work at home now, but I use my studio as, as, as a uh, place to store my finished work and show my finished work and meet collectors. And so, um, and I ended up selling a piece that way. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, this is nice because otherwise I would be sharing, <laughs> you know, there's a, a gallery takes, I did craft galleries years ago and that's a 50% cut. Mm. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's substantial. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know really. It's, I don't know that I'll, I, I, I think I'd like to have a gallery at times, but I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. I, I, it's kind of like they're in Boston. The market for my work tends to be not necessarily in Boston. 
I would say more like New York or California. Um, That's a a Long Island accent I can detect, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. You know, I haven't lived and and grew up about 40 miles north of New York City. I haven't lived there for 45 years. You think I would have gotten rid of this New York accent. I just just want to hear you say the word coffee. Oh. In your Long Island well, accent. <laughs> well, well, if I would, if I really pour it on thickly, it would be, I'm going to take the dog for a walk to get coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I've kind of, uh, I've, you know, I've kind of, uh, I've hopefully it's softened a little bit. It was, it was much worse. <laughs> as bad as it is now. I like it. it. Was worse. I like it. Uh, yeah. well, my girlfriend in Texas, whom I speak to on the phone all the time, tells me whenever she listens to me, or speaks with me. She's thinking of Judge Judy. Oh. I don't know if you get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I just wonder, because you've done both illustration and created art, how different is is it promoting the two? Um, you know, illustration, at least editorial illustration. Well, it was a different time. If you know, if we go back, you know, to the eighties, there was no internet yet, really to put up a website for. And so you took your book, what was called, you called it your book, your portfolio around, and you had to visit people in in person. And, you know, that was, that uh, for some reason that was just easier. I I can't explain it. Um, It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's, you're pounding the pavement, but it was, you know, you have your work and you put it before the right people. And I was, maybe I, maybe I was just always very fortunate. I always seemed to connect with people that wanted to hire me. Um, and then moving on to children's books, that was the toughest of all. Um, you know, because everybody would love to illustrate children's books. And then it's, so there's the, it's, and, and there are many, many, many wonderful illustrators children's book illustrators and authors out there so your com- the competition is fierce um and, and incidentally editorial illustration has truly gone by the wayside uh so that's that market is virtually dead in the water um and but so children's books was very hard so painting again i don't know i think it's you have well into there was no such thing as Instagram, so that's interesting. There was no such thing as websites, so that's you know having a website already has nailed me a few sales. Um, I don't know. It's I I think in some ways it's it's harder than it was in the eighties when you could just meet people in person and talk to them and show them your book, but it's easier than certainly the children's book market. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. I guess it depends how good you are at selling yourself in person as well, because I think I'd be a nightmare. <laughs> but <laughs> you're obviously very good at it. Um, I, you know, I've never, I know people who just by virtue of their visibility on Twitter, for example, got book deals. Wow. And that was never my forte, but I'm learning. <laughs> so yeah. I'm learning the social media um, market, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I honestly, it's fun. I, I'm, I really enjoy Instagram. I love being able to make new quote friends or people that follow you that always comment when you post a picture, there's give and take. We, we appreciate each other work. There's an artist in Australia whose work I love. And we're always commenting. There's an artist in Ireland whose work I love. We're always commenting. And that's lovely really, because you know, I used to have illustrator group meet, meet in my house once a month and I don't have that anymore. And so now I'm sort of doing it by, you know, virtually meeting with other artists up on Instagram um, or on Facebook, less so for me, Facebook, more so Instagram. Um, so that's fun. So in a way it's kind of a mix. I think it's harder because it's, there's a big, bigger competition there, you know, there are millions of people posting art on Instagram, but in a way it's easier. I guess you find yeah. you find your market. I think you know. You know that people used to describe being an artist as quite a solitary um, pastime, but actually now I think it's it's not. I mean, the amount of friends um, I've met online who I actually speak to regularly. I met Tara through on you know being online, and it's totally different now. The, the community is right there on your doorstep for you to find, isn't it? Online, which is great. It is. It's fun. I have Facebook friends, like mm. for example, in Seattle. 
you know, my son was going to college in Seattle. So, uh, you know, last year when we went out there, we all went out to lunch. And some of them I'd only ever met online for years, 15, 20. And so mm. finally just having lunch in person. But you feel like yeah. you've known them already. Yeah. So it is. It is nice. And it is, you know, I personally kind of like the isolation <laughs> of just working alone in my uh-huh. studio with this is what I, I learned. Um, and uh, but I but, you know, it's a little respite to go online and, uh, you know, see what's on Facebook and, and talk to people you know, that have got the same interest and, you know, go through the same, even, same struggle. Even not. I mean, yeah. it's, it can, it's a time yeah. killer. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. It's a terrible. It is. It's a bit uh, of a rabbit hole, isn't it? I think you have to pick and choose when to, to uh, venture down it. <laughs> Definitely not when you should be in studio. It's <laughs> you know, it's, it's especially a problem when you're, um, you know, you, you find yourself having long conversations with somebody you went to high school with. You, and when you were in high school, you didn't do anything. <laughs> but, yeah. but all of a sudden, you're really caring about them, you know. It's yeah. like, oh, my goodness, she's in the hospital. Well, gee, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I got a whole new, a whole new con- number of contacts for me to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh. so we've talked about um, illustration and we've talked about painting. And doodling. So what about sketching? How important do you think regular sketching is for an artist? Do you sketch yourself? Do you carry a sketchbook around? You know, I don't carry one around. Sometimes I do and I have the best intentions and it falls by the wayside. But when I'm home, I'm sketching all the time. And uh, that's just to me is key. You know, you, you just need to, you know, without any constraints, you need to sit down and just see what comes, see what happens. So you know, from your imagination then? Yes. Yes. No, I always draw from my imagination in my book, my mm-hmm. sketchbook. Um, that's just pure pleasure yeah. for me. Uh, you know, put on a book, listen to junk TV, you know, listen to a podcast and then just sketch. Um, and then frequently they turn into paintings. Mm. So I have a, I have, you know, a stash right now in my current sketchbook that I'm thinking of, um, you know, we're working onto canvases or board panels. Actually, I don't generally work on canvas, but panels. Um, and then I, I, uh, I kind of pulled out some really old pencil sketches and have been reworking them, um, thinking that I might try, I might try some acrylics on paper to see what happens. So what are your plans for the future? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I currently, you know, I I think I'm going to go where the wind blows me. Um, I recently... Uh, had some pieces accepted to a tattoo themed show in Florida and I uh, just shipped them out last Friday and um, I'm going to go down for the opening which isn't always doable when they're you know they're around the country and uh, uh, you know I'll see what happens um, I, I'll you know I'll continue to look for opportunities to show my work I'll uh, continue to I have ideas that are that are waiting to get finished um, just paint, you know, just get through the, get, just spend as much time as humanly possible painting and, um, trying to make artwork and see, and then see what happens. You know, it takes, it has a life of its own. I think you, you, if you put too much in the way of expectations on what you're doing, then you're going to get tight. And so you just need to create what your soul is telling you to create. And then see where that leads you. See what the market, you know, the market will find you. The, the, where the direction will almost find you and push you. But first, it, work without the direction necessarily. Just, just create. You know, you just have to just create from the soul. That's that satisfying feeling of just making something that's totally your vision, you know, unique to you. And then you see what happens. You mentioned the tattoo exhibition. Um was that the one I saw you'd done something based on an Instagram person? Yes. <laughs> I, um, I had, was contacted on Instagram by this lovely young woman in Brooklyn. Um, and she said, you know, if you ever, uh, if you ever need some new tattooed models, I'm here for you. <laughs> <laughs> And so I said, oh, that would be great. And I checked her. I said, oh, I'd love to paint you some time. You know, my son lives in Brooklyn. Maybe I'll go down sometime and shoot pictures or whatever. And then I, I had intended to submit the tattooed Frida for the show, but I sold it. And I really wanted another 
a piece along that scale. And I reached out to her. I said, remember those pictures you were offering to send me? <laughs> and she did. She sent me a, a bunch of wonderful pictures of herself. And she's an absolutely beautiful young woman with this gorgeous figure and these beautiful tattoos all over her body. And so um, I painted from them. And I didn't, you know, she's she's much prettier in person or not in person, but in, you know, then, then my painting of her, she's a little older in my painting and maybe she's a little more softic in my painting, but you know, I clearly, she was the starting off point. So it was a wonderful collaboration. She loves the painting. It's, there's going to be a fashion show associated with this tattoo show and they're looking for models. And I said, you know, Lauren, you should look into going down there and because she has, she does model. She is a model. Um, and wouldn't it be fun, you know, if she could stand next to the painting of her when she's, when she's in Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was wonderful. That was kind of one of those serendipitous things that I didn't go looking for it. It just kind of came to me. Um, and it's, it, that's the kind of magic and serendipity that I love. So where can people find you on Instagram and um, where can people find out more about you in general and in, and also your, obviously your books? Okay. My books are available on Amazon. Um, uh, some are out of print, but they're still available. Um, just They can just put in Johansson Newman or Barbara Johansson Newman and they'll find them. Um, on Instagram, I'm just Johansson Newman on Instagram. And then my website is just johanssonnewman.com. And so, um, and then, you know, there's all, I generally post, I'm, I almost post things more frequently on Instagram than I do on the website. I haven't really updated the website yet. So uh, with my latest piece, but I generally add it, you know, as I finish a piece, I'll generally put it up on the website. I will we'll put links to the website and your books and things as well on, on the show notes. It's been really, really lovely to talk to you, Barbara. It really has. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. I, I hope that um, there are some people out there that will kind of just jump in and create what their heart tells them they need to create. Yeah. Absolutely. Great advice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So uh, my pleasure, truly. <laughs> Take care then. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes.